will be Dr. Robert Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor uh, is an associate professor of neurology and internal medicine at The Ohio State Uni University College of Medicine. Um, Bob was the founding medical director of the Center for Palliative Care at The Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, where he currently co-chairs the Ethics Committee, as well as serving as the chief of staff of the OSU James Cancer Hospital. Today, uh, Bob Taylor will talk to us about improving DNR discussions, a categorical approach. Bob. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to the center. Uh, I was in the class of 93, so this is about a little more than 20 years since I was here. And uh, the beginning of this thought process that led to this uh, presentation really started during that uh, time at this uh, program, Ellen Fox taught a course, uh, Concepts in uh, Clinical Ethics, or Topics in Clinical Ethics, which is where I read one of the few of the papers that started this discussion, or this thought process, and then in addition, uh, John Lantos uh, talked about, we, he and I worked on a futility paper, um, and then others in the faculty and in the group uh, contributed to thoughts that eventually led to this uh, this process. So, oops, going the wrong way. <laughs> Let's try this. Okay, that's where I'm going to end. That's where I'm going. <laughs> All right, so uh, this, these are my objectives. So to discuss the appropriateness of stratifying patients according to three broad medical categories based on likely outcomes of resuscitation, and then explain why DNR discussions should be framed differently depending on which of the three categories the patient is in. So unfortunately, none of us live forever, so we all are going to die at uh, some time in the foreseeable future, and this should inform our thoughts uh, about this uh, problem. Um, this is probably, I, I'm pretty sure this paper was discussed in Ellen's course. Um, Blackhall, Leslie Blackhall, must we always use CPR, uh, New England Journal article 1987, and many of you are aware of this article. Um, and she raised the question as to is this idea that we always offer CPR to everybody appropriate? And there have been many, many people who've written on this topic subsequently, and I think they are all on to something. I think that uh, I'm hoping that I have a, a, an approach that helps uh, make this less of a problem. We'll see what people think. So this is the, probably the paper that sort of got me to finally sort of frame things the way that I do in this paper, this presentation. So you were at all at MD Anderson looked at outcomes from cardiac arrest, and they, 244, a large number, looked at what they called anticipated arrest and sudden arrest. And anticipated arrest in this paper was people who were in the hospital, MD Anderson, where everybody taking care of them, the doctors and all, thought that this patient was going to arrest. For one reason or another, they were still full code, and they were all therefore coded. The sudden arrests were people who were not expected to die during that admission, and suddenly had an arrest unexpectedly, and of course they were all res resuscitated. And you can see that the outcome uh, is quite different. So on the side where the, it was sudden unexpected arrest, approximately 20% uh, survived to leave the hospital. Um, and that's consistent with general expectations throughout the country. On the other side, where the anticipated arrest, or where arrest was anticipated, there actually were a percentage, about 10%, who recovered from the original arrest, but nonetheless, zero of those patients survived to leave the hospital. So 0% survival to leave the hospital when the arrest was anticipated. So this is an important number. I mean, these numbers are strikingly different. Large number of N of zero versus 20%. But somehow these statistics don't help us in, in general. And I'm gonna come uh, talk about why that is or, or what an alternative approach is. So this is a paper that was published in Supportive Oncology, rejected by multiple other, other journals first, but uh, ended up in Supportive Oncology. Uh, myself, a colleague who's a, a powder care physician, Jillian Gus, 
Weston and Dr. Wells de Gregorio, who's a psychologist that works in our palliative care program. And we came up with this paradigm of trying to categorize people into these three groups, which I don't think will surprise anybody, the basically healthy, advanced or chronic illness, and the imminently dying. And I'm gonna give you some just quick examples of each of these cases. So case one would be the basically healthy person. So a healthy 45-year-old woman admitted to our hospital for acute right upper quadrant pain with low-grade fever. Workup reveals acute cholecystitis. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is recommended. Turns out she has no living will, no power of attorney. That doesn't surprise anybody, probably. Married and has three children. Code status has never been previously addressed, no surprise. By default, of course, her code status is full code. So should her code status be addressed in this setting? And if so, how should it be addressed? And should advanced directives be addressed? And I'll come back and try to answer those questions in a minute. Case two is the middle category. A 72-year-old man uh, admitted to his local hospital for a two-day uh, history of cough and fever of 103 degrees has a past medical history, hypertension, early COPD, previous stroke with left mild hemiparesis and intermittent dysphagia. He now has aspiration pneumonia and his respiratory status is getting tenuous. So he also has no living will or power of attorney for health care. <clears throat> He's widowed with four children. He lives with his girlfriend. That's a red flag for most of us in this group. That is a little unclear who is a surrogate would be. And he has no power of attorney, but he also has no code status, never been addressed. Code status is full code by default. <clears throat> so as the admitting physician, should his code status be addressed? And if so, how should it be addressed? And should advanced directives be addressed? And I hope everybody would answer that question question, yes, uh, given the complexity of his social uh, relationships. So case three. So a 67-year-old woman is admitted to her local hospital for cough and fever, found to have acute renal failure, and is delirious. Turns out she has stage four lung cancer, COPD, CHF, and chronic mild renal failure. She did not tolerate chemotherapy, which was attempted for her lung cancer. Subsequently, she's been living in an extended care facility for three months. Uh, she's had anorexia, failure to thrive, and progressive weight loss over those three months, and now has been bedbound for the past two weeks. She is diagnosed with post-obstructive pneumonia. She appears to be on the verge of respiratory failure. So, Surprisingly, she has no living will or power of attorney, or unsurprisingly, depending on your perspective. She's widowed, has one daughter who lives in town, so at least we have an identified surrogate, presumably. Code status, again, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, in the ECF was full code. She, nobody had uh, gotten around to addressing that or else it had not been uh, changed for one reason or another. So should her code status be addressed? If so, how? And sh should she or can she have advanced directives at this point? No. So this is what we, as I go back a second, sorry. So if you recall, these were the three categories we were talking about. So we have one case in each of these three categories. I'm going to go through them one at a time fairly quickly uh, over as, as to why they're, how they should be treated differently. So it turns out if you have a basically healthy person, the expected outcome in the hospital setting probably is about 20% survival to discharge if you have a cardiac arrest. We all know out of hospital is different. But there's one place out of hospital where the cardiac arrest outcomes are even better than the hospital. Does anybody know where that is? The casino. <laughs> It turns out casinos, and there's actually a nice paper that shows about a 40% outcome of, of witness resuscit or cardiac arrest, 40% recovery um, in a casino because people are basically healthy. They get a shock to their system. They arrest. They're prepared for it. They don't want dead people uh, leaving their casino. So that's the best place to have an arrest if you're wondering. <laughs> So, but let's just say we have a healthy person. This young woman comes in getting a procedure. So I think many people would say the DNR discussion is really unnecessary because the this was why we developed resuscitation was for people like this. Now, some people would say, yes, you should have a discussion and maybe you should, uh, but I think we would all be a little surprised and disconcerted if the person wanted not to be resuscitated. And I think that would make me concerned and make many people concerned that there's something else going on that we should investigate. Now, on the other hand, advanced care planning would be very appropriate because 
something bad could happen. She could have a bad outcome. She could have a, a neurological injury. And so knowing what her preference is would be and who uh, would be her decision maker would be very, very helpful. And the rationale, as I sort of already said, is that resuscitation is highly likely to improve survival in an otherwise healthy patient, so it's highly indicated. Death would be a tragedy in this person because it's completely unexpected and uh, there's no reason this woman should die except for some horrible tragedy. So again, the follow-up is then to provide advanced care planning and to prepare the person uh, for possible future outcome, bad outcomes. Now. Oops, I don't, I'm going the wrong way again. How did I do this? All right, so number two, this is the middle category, and this is what we deal with 90% of the time in the hospital, I think, where we, do, where we discuss code status. So <clears throat> this is a person, as the member, the middle person who has COPD, has had a stroke, now has some pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. This person, it's a very, you know, there's a realistic chance this person will die in the hospital. Many people would say it wouldn't be a horrible tragedy, certainly not as much of a tragedy as the first person. And in this, this is precisely where DNR discussions are essential, because really, in this case, you need to find out the person's values, their preferences, what constitutes quality of life. It's, you know, all of the things that we usually do in having these DNR discussions. It's really a matter of the patient's preferences based on a good understanding of the medical situation, the likely outcomes, et cetera. And again, outcomes are less good statistically than in the healthy person. So, and the follow-up would be that you would want to reevaluate this periodically because a person who's getting sicker might want to be full code initially and then change their mind, or if they're getting better, they might reverse their decision. But it's also a situation where, again, you'd want to make sure you dealt with the advanced directives. <clears throat> now, this is the group where I think I hope I have something a little different to say than what most people have said in the past. So 0% survival to discharge if you have a person who is imminently dying. And I think this is the, the key, if you go to the rationale, this is the key point I want to make, that a cardiac arrest in this situation is the mechanism of death, not the cause of death. And we don't treat mechanisms. Now, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. So if I'm standing here and my heart stops, as far as I know I'm healthy, feel free to try to resuscitate me. Because, but for my cardiac arrest, I'm not dying. But if I have advanced cancer and multiple other medical problems, and I'm declining, I'm dying from all of those combination of problems, and eventually my heart stops. That's the final event. That's the mechanism by which I die. It's not the cause of my death. And treating mechanisms doesn't really make sense. And if, in fact, the person is imminently dying, their death is not preventable. They are, um, even if they survive the arrest, they are not uh, going to survive to leave the hospital or long beyond that. Now, you could argue there's always a degree of irreducible uncertainty, and I won't debate that, but I think within reasonable medical certainty, we can identify people who are imminently dying. Now, so again, in this case, you could make an argument that this is a place where we would impose DNR status on people, and people have made that assertion. I don't think that's really necessary. I think it's better to use this explanation, this information, to help people understand, and you'll see uh, my point in a minute. But the follow-up here, too, I just want to emphasize. So the follow-up here is that the patient is dying, so we need to in, uh, invoke palliative and supportive care. We need to address antici anticipatory grief, uh, physical, emotional, practical, and spiritual aspects of dying and bereavement care. So we really need to change our paradigm, uh, and, and obviously, as a palliative care physician, uh, people, uh, you know, we, we want to focus on all of these other aspects and help make the death less traumatic, less painful for both the patient and the family and those who care for the patient. So the key point, again, is that in this third group, the recommendation for DNR, unlike the first, the third, the middle group, it's not a value-based recommendation. It's a medically-based recommendation. I think that's where we've been struggling all of these years is that 
we shouldn't impose our values on others. But, and we've, I don't think we've had a good paradigm for saying this is where it's a medical decision. But I think this is the, the key criteria, that when we're dealing with the mechanism of death, there's no point in trying to treat that. The underlying uh, causes are not affected by treating the mechanism. So in this setting, I believe the appropriate thing to do is to actually recommend DNR status, to be very clear that the patient is dying, emphasize that the cardiac arrest is the mechanism and not the cause of death, to say things like attempt resuscitation, and if there's resistance, obviously listen, understand the source of the resistance. Often there's an emotional distress that is underlying the resistance. As it turns out, most people don't want to die. <laughs> Know, even if they're old and sick and frail, um, or young and sick and frail. And they need help processing and preparing psychologically. But I've never met a person who was dying who succeeded in not dying because they didn't want to. So I don't think you can take that as a, as a reason to not go there. Um, so, Emphasizing the outcomes and the negative, and, and again, if you're, there's resistance, so emphasizing the outcomes, negative effects, and uh, the benefits. So two quick more slides. So an example of a script. Unfortunately, your disease is terminal and will soon cause your death. When that happens, your heart and breathing will stop. Any attempt to resuscitate you will fail. I recommend that at that time, we focus on assuring your comfort and allow you to die peacefully and naturally. Does that make sense to you? So you say that to the patient or the family, depending on the situation. Another example of critical care, and this is, we see, obviously most of us have seen this. Currently we are doing everything we can to support your loved one's vital, function, vital functions. If, despite these efforts, her heart stops, any attempt to resuscitate her will, will fail. I recommend that if that happens, we focus on assuring her comfort and allow her to die as peacefully and naturally as possible. Does that make sense to you? Again, you're making a recommendation, it's medically based, and you're asking for their assent. So I won't reiterate this because we're out of time. Uh, I think I've made my point. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we have time for a few questions. Please. Hello, uh, Charles Rhea. I'm a palliative care physician here at the University of Chicago. I have a few, qu I have one question about um, where in someone's medical training would you start this and how, um, you know, in terms of the appropriateness of this conversation. I, when it comes to your typical intake of uh, code status, I've heard everything uh, from residents on the spectrum of, well, if your heart were to stop, do you want us to start it back up again? To the other end of the spectrum where it's like, well, it's going to crack your ribs and punch your lungs, like really painting dire consequences. And, mm -hmm. you know, neither are really kind of an ideal way to frame this discussion. So do you have any thoughts in terms of how to further education on this topic and how to have these conversations? Well, I think the easiest way to think about imminent death is to start where we're absolutely certain it's imminent and work backwards. <laughs> because if we try to go the other way, it's very, very hard. Uh, of course, in the real world, we have to start at the other end and go forward. And, and I think this is an example of where experience and observation help. There's one of the fast facts, David Weissman uh, talks about the signs of imminent death. And there are many times I walk into a room and see the patient and say they're dying and everybody around me is like, what? And so, you know, it's, it's, it's part of it's just having a recognition of that. Um, but I do think we can see people, and, and as you saw in that study, they recognize these people as people in whom they anticipated the heart would be stopping, and yet they resuscitated them. I don't know what kinds of conversations they had. The other point I would make is, obviously this doesn't always work, but in my experience is that it works quite a bit more often than not. Uh, and it relieves a lot of distress from the families and patients because they don't feel like they're making a decision to give up on somebody, they're just acknowledging the, the situation and the reality. Um, so I think there's actually, and I, I didn't have time to go into this, there are criteria for imminent death, so one of the bed bound for two weeks, um, decreasing mental status, decreasing urine output, things like that, obviously modeling cold extremities, et cetera. So there are criteria you can use, and obviously context, advanced cancer, advanced heart disease, et cetera, seeing these signs in that kind of a patient, you're more likely to con be confident that it's imminent death. 
uh, I found that distinction between um, mechanism of death and cause of death to be very illuminating. And, and you used it to indicate that when the physicians were recommending against resuscitation, uh, I think you made that point, it was not based on a value judgment, but on a medical dis decision, uh, one for which there was hard data and hard evidence. Yep. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.